All right, good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for joining us today for a Click That Saves Lives, our occupant protection webinar. This webinar is a product of collaboration between two of our nine regional safety coalitions here in Louisiana, Acadiana Regional Transportation Safety Coalition and the South Central Regional Safety Coalition. I am Cassie Parker, the coordinator for South Central Regional Safety Coalition. And I'm Ron Chikowski with the Acadiana Region. And we hope that you are ready to learn more about seatbelt laws here in Louisiana, diversity in seatbelts, statistics on seatbelts, our Save by the Belt program, as well as our SAD program. We wanted to ensure to keep your attention so we have a variety of polling questions for you to answer. However, if you have any questions that are not covered, just go ahead and place that in the Q&A. You are automatically muted right now. So if you have any questions, you can use that Q&A to communicate with us as well. This webinar will be recorded and posted online on both the South Central and Acadiana Regional Safety Coalition websites. Today's presenters are a few of our valued safety partners from the state as well as our regions. We have Senior Trooper Jesse Lagrange from Louisiana State Police Troop C. We have Ms. Shanita Vasquez from Louisiana Highway Safety Commission, Ms. Tracy LaMare from Sudden Impact, Mr. Dylan Ivey from Students Against Destructive Decisions, or SAD. And we'll get started with our agenda. As I mentioned, seatbelt law, statistics, diversity, saved by the belt, peer-to-peer -peer activities. To start our presentation is Mr. or Senior Trooper Jesse Lagrange. He is the Public Information Officer at Louisiana State Police Troop C. He's also the Young Drivers Team Leader for the South Central Regional Safety Coalition. He's served 12 years with State Police. He's also a Child Passenger Seat Technician. He's been doing that for 11 years. He also does reconstructionists for crash and commercial vehicles. Take it away, Jesse. Hi, thanks for having me. As uh, Cassie said, I'm Trooper Jesse Lagrange. I'm the Public Information Officer for Troop C. So uh, if you do have questions, comments, we do have the chat box. We encourage you to do uh, to post them there. But we're gonna start off with our first round of questions and uh, just to gauge your knowledge and see um, where it's at whenever it comes to the seatbelt usage. All right, we'll give you one minute for round one of questions. Get your answers in. Time is ticking. And we're going to close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. All right. Hopefully, everyone had enough time to go through those five. And uh, throughout the program, we're going to have five polling questions uh, periodically just to uh, kind of prepare you a little bit, uh, but they do, uh, some of them a little bit later might be a little longer. Uh, but let's see your answers right here. It looks like for number one, how old do you have to be to ride in the front seat? Uh, the majority of you picked 13. <clears throat> And number two, is it legal to ride in the cargo area of an SUV? So we're thinking, you know, the way back part of the SUV. Um, that looks pretty good on number two. Number three, is it legal to ride in the back of a pickup truck? Um, a little bit closer on that one, um, but that's a good question because uh, we see that in our area. And then why are seatbelts not frequently present on school buses? Um, so a couple different opinions on that, but we will go over these here in a second. And do farm vehicles drive, uh, drivers have to wear uh, a seatbelt? And 
that one's uh, kind of spread out too. All right, so here in a second, we'll go ahead and close out this screen. Um, all right, so the first question, how old do you have to be to ride in the front seat? This one can give our, uh, uh, our parents that may be on a little bit of an issue because uh, some younger children might be already used to riding in the front seat. So the answer is 13 years of age, as you can see, and Louisiana seatbelt law, uh, they were changed uh, last year in 2019 to reflect the best practices whenever it comes to um, children riding safe in the vehicle. And yes, 13-year-olds, uh, uh, you know, are teenagers, they're not considered so much children anymore, but 12 years old and younger have to be in the back that be in the second row or the third row. And um, a lot of kids, you know, once they hit that nine-year-old, 10-year-old mark, they want to be able to jump in the front. They think they're, you know, they're old enough. But Louisiana law does say they have to be at least 13 years of age to ride in the front. So if that's some, uh, you know, habit that you have to change, we we'll hope you go ahead and make that correction. If you have younger brothers or sisters that, uh, you know, want to do that every now and again, Let's go ahead and make sure we tell them that the law is 13 and they do have to ride in the back. All right, is it legal to ride in the cargo area of an SUV? Um, you might wanna put your younger brothers and sisters in there sometimes, but no, it is not. Uh, whenever they're inside the vehicle, they do have to um, be buckled in. Louisiana law does say that you can't transport people uh, or more people than you have seat belts for. So you have to be able to provide a seat belt for them and they have to be buckled while the vehicle is in motion. All right, so is it legal to ride in the back of a pickup truck? It is in Louisiana, yes. Um, there was some questions about that. You know, yes it is, no you have to be buckled, uh, but it is as long as you are 13 years and up, or I'm sorry, 12 years and up. 11 on down, you can't ride in the back. So you do have to be at least 12 years old um, but no one of any age can ride in the back of a pickup truck on an interstate. Of course, we know the speeds are a whole lot higher out there on the interstates, and um, we want to make sure that nobody, you know, whether adults or children, are riding in the back. And it also doesn't count for uh, Mardi Gras parades, uh, maybe, you know, Christmas parades that's coming up. Um, if you're going, you know, 15 miles an hour or slower, um, then it doesn't count. And also, if you do have an adult with you back there during an emergency situation, then you can uh, have those younger children ride in the back. Uh, but it's always best practice not to, just for safety reasons. Now, why are seatbelts not frequently present on school buses? You know, I get this question a lot, especially in my sudden impact classes. And uh, there are a couple answers to that. Uh, school buses are a whole lot larger whenever you think, uh, compare them to uh, regular vehicles, and um, they're a whole lot heavier. Their center of gravity is a whole lot taller also, so you have this bigger, heavier vehicle, uh, typically a slower moving vehicle. It's got high visibility paint on it, and um, the flashing lights, and I'd say the majority of people are a whole lot safer around these vehicles because they know it carries our precious cargo. Our younger children, all the way up through our high school years, uh, those are the ones that we especially want to be safe around. And so while they're on these vehicles, uh, they do have a lot of seats. And those seats are compartmentalized, basically. If you think of an egg carton, uh, the seats are close together and uh, they're kind of spongy. You know, they have that material where um, it kind of bounces if you push on it. And it's right there in front of you. So if the vehicle is in motion or if it's stopped, if a car does strike it, Remember, we have a heavier vehicle with a higher center of gravity, so it's not gonna feel the impact as much, but then the kids are gonna have those um, softer seats around them. And it's like that egg in the egg carton to where it won't have a lot of distance to the travel. So it'll be safer in its own little area. And that's why we need to make sure our children are seated while the vehicle is in motion. Uh, but also if there's some type of emergency to where there's a crash or a fire or something to where uh, the kids need to get out quickly, then um, the school bus driver would have to go and maybe help, you know, these children individually one by one to get those seat belts off so that you can imagine the amount of time that's going to take to clear that bus. So if the kids are able to get up freely, um, you know, in some type of emergency, 
then uh, that would definitely help things uh, whenever it comes to uh, getting everyone off in time. And I can't see the bottom question. Jesse, do form vehicle drivers have to wear a seatbelt? Okay. They are one of our exempted drivers uh, whenever it comes to our seatbelt laws. And there are some stipulations with that. Uh, but our postal workers who are uh, running their route, basically doing under 25 miles an hour, they're not required to wear one. Um, but farm vehicles also aren't uh, required to wear a seatbelt as long as they're within five miles of uh, their primary work location or their farm, whatever it may be. Um, but it's always a good idea to wear it. Uh, they do have uh, pickup trucks that are considered farm imp implements, and they will have a specific license plate that you know labels it as a farm truck. Um, but you know, once they get all on the roadway, they're still susceptible uh, to crashes and to crash forces, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but yes, they are exempted um, as long as they are working around their farm uh, location. Thank you so much, Jesse. And I see we have a question and we'll get to that at the end. Uh, we definitely appreciate that. Awesome job, Jesse. Next, we have Ms. Shanita Vasquez from Louisiana Highway Safety Commission. She is a native of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And after graduating from Baker High School, she enlisted in the US Navy. She served seven years on active duty. She completed two tours in Iraq, one in the USS with Whidbay Island, LSD 41, and boots on the ground with the Task Force 184. Thank you for your service, Ms. Shanita. She fought in the War on Terror, Operation Enduring Freedom, and Operation Iraqi Freedom. Once she successfully completed her active duty mission obligation, she enrolled and graduated from Southern University and Agriculture and Mechanical College, Baton Rouge, with a Bachelor's of Science in Business Management. She volunteers to continue to serve her country. In 2014, she enlisted in the US Navy Reserve where she's currently classified as a, drill, a drilling reservist. In 2010, Shanita started working for, her, for Baton Rouge Police Department in the county. A year later, she transferred to the legal department where she became a senior legal spe specialist to the legal advisor where she was also recognized as the 2018 Civilian of the Year. In 2019, she entered into state government with Highway Safety Commission, where she currently serves as the Occupant Protection, Diversity Outreach, Regional Coalition Program Coordinator. During 2020, Shanita completed her Master's of Business Administration and Project Management from Columbia Southern University. Thank you, Shanita. You can go ahead. Bienvenidos. Estoy muy feliz de que todos ustedes pueden practicar en este seminario. Mi nombre es Janita Vasquez. Soy Baton Rouge, Louisiana, y trabajo en el Louisiana Highway Safety Commission. So I'm going to stop right there because that's kind of where my Spanish limits. <laughs> But what I said was, um, hello, welcome. I'm very happy that all you guys are able to be here with us today. My name is Shanita Vasquez. I am from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I work at the Louisiana Highway Safety Commission as the Occupant Protection Diversity Outreach Program Coordinator. I try to say that three times <laughs> fast. I am very, very, very happy to be here. Thank you so much to Ashley, Ron, and Cassie for um, asking um, Highway Safety to be a part of this amazing webinar. Um, I hope you guys are listening and pay attention because these panelists that are um, going to be speaking to you today, like um, Trooper Lagrange, they're going to give you some great information to take on and also to pass on to um, other people in your family, your friends, and your coworkers. So, Without further ado, we're going to get started. Next slide, please. So why not start with a pop quiz? First question, well, my only question really. Approximately how many people in Louis, how many people live in Louisiana? And I'll give you guys like 20 seconds to look over this. We have 4,580,000. 320 million or 2,371,000. I didn't say the rest because that's a long time. So, so just think about that. How many people do you think live in Louisiana? 
we have two that say a a okay and if any oh here we go here we go we're getting we get please answer in the q a session awesome yes we have a's all the way all the way so actually the a's have it congratulations so uh, i this number i got from the u.s census so approximately and you know there is a margin of error there's approximately 4,580,000 to 4,680,000 uh, residents in Louisiana. So before we go over to the next slide, I want you guys, I want to go over the rest of these answers for you. So letter B, B is 185,186. That is the number of people that are classified that are either deaf or hard of hearing. C, 322,775,000. That's an approximation of how many people they are, there are in the United States. So in the United States of America, there's approximately 320 million to 328 million people that filled out the census that they can classify for, but there is that margin of error. The last one is, 2,371,253. What number do you think that can be? I'm gonna give you guys like 15 seconds to type in, like, what do you think it could be? 2 million people, what do you, what category do you think that falls into? And y'all can go ahead and put that in the Q and A and we'll, we'll see those answers. So I'm give you like 10 seconds. We have car accident death, motor vehicle accidents, year in the U.S., visitors, drivers in Louisiana who are driving. Okay, that's really well, good. Wait, wait, wait. We okay. got registered drivers. Okay, five more seconds. Four, three. We got accidents. 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 All right, and close. And close. Okay, those, what is it, Anita? Are, those are really good guesses, but there are actually in in Louisiana, there are two million, approximately two million women in Louisiana. So out of that four million five hundred eighty thousand, there's too many, uh, half of those are women. So and then there's one thing that I did see here when you guys were given um when you were giving your answers, and this isn't my part, I'm pretty sure someone else gonna cover this, but I saw, I heard people type accidents a lot, a lot. Actually, there is no such thing as an accident. We classify, that is classified as a crash. A crash means that something was preventable, um, something was not preventable. And because the majority of the crashes that happen, they're due to human error, we, we, those are classified as crashes. So from now on, we're just gonna go ahead and take that accident word out of our vocabulary. You have a, you accidentally fall down the stairs or something like that. You accidentally stub your toe. You know, you accidentally ate that piece of cake. You know, you don't accidentally um, rear in the back of somebody. So we're gonna take accident out of our vocabulary. So we, let's go to the next slide. Next slide, what is diversity? So diversity is the practice or quality of including or involving people from different race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, social economic status, age, physical abilities, religious beliefs, disabilities. All that is is basically saying diversity encompasses everybody no matter what your background is, who you are, how you grew up, how much money you have, what type of car you drive, what school you went to, the color of your skin, your sexual orientation, diversity is everyone. Blue eyes, big earrings, you know, it doesn't matter. So how does this affect transportation safety? So in the beginning, when I first started talking, I was speaking in Spanish. What um, diverse, how does this affect transportation safety is because there are a lot of people, as we said, and as I said in the beginning across Louisiana, Louisiana 62% is white Americans, Caucasian, 32% is black, 1% is Asian, 5.3% is Hispanic. There's 185,000 people who are 
either deaf or hard of hearing. There's a large number of people on different social economic levels. Bringing the traffic safety message, bringing the traffic safety message to those variety of people where they would be able to relate to it is very important. There, I noticed there's a lot of driving schools. There's a lot of students on here. I know everyone comes across so many different people and don't you on a day-to-day -day basis try to relate to somebody. If you see somebody struggling with something, you wanna know what's going on. So the traffic safety message needs to go across in different ways. So as far as the deaf or hard of hearing, that in Louisiana, majority of the people who are deaf or hard of hearing does American Sign Language. Hispanics, that's speaking Spanish. So when I first started talking, I bet you some of you were like, what is she doing? You didn't know what I was saying. You probably picked up on my name, Louisiana, Baton Rouge, and Louisiana Highway Safety Commission. Everything else outside of that, you probably didn't know what was going on. Some people who actually paid attention a little bit in high school in Spanish, you know, um, probably picked up on some of the stuff, but just think about transportation safety, learning, learning how to buckle up, um, buckle up in the car, making sure everyone knows if you're 13 and older, it's, um, 12, and young, 12 and younger sits in the back, 13, you get to be promoted to the front seat, making sure that your child is rear facing up to the age of two until the, until the um, possible point, you know, bringing that diversity message. So what we do, and especially these partners that's on the um, webinar with you, is we try to make sure that everybody, no matter what their background is, have um, the opportunity to learn about highway safety, transportation safety, traffic safety in a way that they can relate to. Next slide, please. So what are some diversity efforts? What are you guys doing? So I'm again, I'm very, very pleased to be in partnership with great people around Louisiana. We actually have our Outreach, re outreach efforts that's going to the deaf and hard of hearing community. We partner up with our WIC, that's the Women, Infant, and Children's programs to bring um, transportation safety message to them. Our military outreach, um, as um, Cassie said in the beginning, I served a lot of time on active duty in the military and I am a drill and reservist. One of the things that I do is travel a lot because I'm in Baton Rouge, I drill um, over a hundred miles away. So I'm traveling once a month over that, over that time. So what is that? I'm in the car. There are hundreds of people that come from all over Louisiana or all over other states to come to drill. So that's making sure that our military people are protected. Hispanic and Vietnamese community. We have amazing partners that are bringing the transportation message and translating it from English to um, Spanish and to Vietnamese. We also are very concerned about our mature drivers. Our mature drivers are the ones that are um, older, we're going to say older than 40. That's what we're going to call mature today. But those are our mature drivers. We're making sure that, you know, our grand, our parents, our grandparents, are, are up to date and know how to ride in the vehicle because there are now, I don't know about you guys, but there are the, these new cars that's coming out. There's a lot of buttons. I don't know what to do with half of those buttons. I had to take a class on what to do with those buttons. So the, the car fit is helping our mature drivers, making sure that they are a certain distance away from the steering wheel. They can see over the steering wheel. Their seat belt is going across their shoulder across their shoulder over and over their hips, you know? So we're also partnering with fraternities and sororities. Fraternities and sororities are helping us out with that young driver aspect, you know, making sure that they help us um, get out the message. So this um, message is just to, this part of the webinar is just to let you know that diversity is very important. We want everyone to know that they need to buckle up every trip, every seat, every time. We want our children to ride safe. We want them to be able to grow up because also there's a lot of people that's coming from different countries and living in Louisiana. Louisiana is like a big old gumbo pot. You know, we have everybody here. So you just throw them in the pot, you know? So we want to make sure that they know coming from their countries that 
you know, it may like in South America, seatbelt safety may not be as important as it is here or in Africa. It may not be as important as it is here. We want them to know when they get here that, you know, you do, everyone needs to be buckled up. Your children need to be riding in the car seat and you need to have the car seat installed. If you can wiggle too much with somebody's going to say that I don't want to steal nobody's thunder, but if you can wiggle it too much, um, that means that it's not installed properly. So I just, again, want to say thank you very much. I want to make sure that you guys know in English, buckle up every trip, every seat, every time. Also in Spanish, abrochate, cada viaje, cada asiento, cada vez. Thank you very much. And I will be here um, at the end if there are any questions for us, um, for me on um, diversity efforts. And if you would like to partner as well on any diversity efforts that you think. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much, Shanita. Thank you for all of that great information on diversity. You know, I don't think people see how much diversity there actually is. Mm -hmm. So I definitely appreciate your, your presentation and sharing all of that great information with us. Thank Jesse, you. we have a we have some more polling questions and I'm gonna let you take it away. All right, round two for our polling questions. Again, we have five of them here for you. So if you would go, th go through those and these are our, are they a myth or is it real questions? Uh, there are a lot of things that go around them. Um, I have friends that, you know, they have their own answers to things where they think it's my opinion or this is what I heard. But let's go through these questions and see, you know, what is the real answer to it? Is this something that, you know, people made up or is this, you know, a real thing, a real law, a real thing that uh, keeps us safe or things that can hurt us inside the vehicle? So you all have five seconds left to answer. Five seconds. We got to give them five more seconds, Jesse. All right. I'm sorry, Trooper Lagrange. Ah, first name's good. <laughs> there we go. Awesome. All right. So we've got our answers here, and you can go ahead and use your cursor. I think you can do it on the screen and go through them and see. Uh, number four was close to being half. Uh, number two got close to being half. So that's pretty good. And what's y'all? Okay, let's go through these real quick. All right, if you have a, uh, your car that has airbags, do you still need to wear your seat belt? And that is a real um, thing here. Yes, you do have to wear your seat belt. Um, and let's put aside that, you know, it is the law that we have to uh, buckle up. Um, but think about that, you know, as a personal safety level. Yes, we want to wear our seat uh, seat belt, even if we do have airbags, um, because those airbags are a supplemental restraint system. If you look on your car on the dashboard or on the steering wheel, it'll say SRS. Supplement means in addition to. It's a secondary uh, safety feature. Now, what is it safe or secondary to? Of course, we know the seat belt. That's our primary safety feature once we get in the car because if you're sitting in the back seat, you don't necessarily have those airbags in the front of you. So you might have those side curtain airbags, but you don't have the steering wheel, the dashboard. Um, so that is still your primary um, safety feature. Now airbags, as I said, are in addition to just like vitamins are supplements. They're in addition to food. You know, we don't just eat uh, vitamins day in and day out. You know, those are taken in addition to the food to give our body nutrition. So um, just because you have airbags doesn't mean you're safe without that seatbelt. You have to have it on. All right, number two, seatbelts can trap you in a fire or underwater. Of course, that is a myth. Uh, I saw, you know, the answers were kind of close on this one, but it is a myth because if you think about it, you have to survive the crash first. You know, surviving the crash is the main um goal every time you get into a car and you travel down the roadway. If you think about jumping off a diving board into a swimming pool and do a belly flop, is it not, you know, a nice, comfy, soft pillow? No, and our body hits it, it stings. Same thing with a car, except the car is going a whole lot faster whenever it hits the bayou and 
we're not short on bayous around here. You can go just about anywhere and find water in Louisiana. Uh, but you have to survive the crash first. Once the car hits it, your body's going to fly forward. And if you don't have your seatbelt on, you're going to get knocked out by hitting the dashboard, by hitting the windshield. Or if you're in the back seat, you're going to fly over. So then you're not going to be able to get out the car at all. So you have to survive the crash first to increase your chances um, of getting out of the vehicle, whether it's a fire or being in water. All right, number three, if you're not going far or not traveling fast, are seatbelts really necessary? Of course they are. We'll look at a video here um, in a few seconds that'll show you the importance of it, uh, but they are. Uh, very necessary. We think about uh, routine trips, you know, it's just around the corner. I've gone there several times. I know my way, I'm familiar with it. Um, but you got to remember, not everybody else is going as fast as you are. You may be obeying the speed limit, but somebody else may not. Once you get into that collision, their speed might be a whole lot greater than yours. And that's going to transfer into your vehicle, causing your damage and your injuries to be a little worse, maybe a whole lot worse. So just remember if you're taking that little short trip, you never know what's gonna happen because you don't know what the other drivers are gonna be doing out there. So again, that goes back to being your primary safety feature. That's the number one thing you can do to keep yourself safe in the vehicle, in any pos uh, seating position and at any time. All right, so number four, your seatbelt can hurt you in a crash. That is real. You know, we don't think about it whenever it comes to seat belts because it's there to keep us safe. It's there to protect us. But remember, the, just the same as your car or your truck is hitting another vehicle, your body is slamming into your seat belt. Because when your body goes forward, you know, where's that pressure coming from? It's the belt itself. Now they do stretch, you know, they will give a little bit but the idea behind the seatbelt is to slow your body down gradually, not all at once. You know, people say the fall isn't what kill you, it's that sudden stop at the bottom. Um, it's the same in car crashes. Airbags are there to do the same, to slow you down gradually. Once you uh, come in contact with it, it's gonna slow you down a little bit at a time working with your seatbelt. That's also doing the same thing. And, um, if your body's flying forward, you know, say 60 miles an hour and you weigh 200 pounds, anybody know the equation for force? You know, I'll give it to you now, but it's mass times acceleration. So we can't change our body weight, but we can change our speed, that acceleration part. So I weigh 200 pounds, I'm doing 60 miles an hour. That is now 12,000 pounds of force. So even though we have that little seat belt, it is gonna give it is you know, made of cloth, but with 12,000 pounds, we're all human. And it is gonna do a little bit of damage to us, but overall, it increases our chances of surviving that crash. And we'll see that in a little bit as well. I won't give that answer away. Number five, you're safer in a pickup truck, so wearing a seatbelt is not necessary. Of course, that's a myth. Uh, people think because I'm in this big truck, it might be a jacked up four by four or something like that. I'm bigger than the little cars that are out there, the smaller ones, but you're still a human, still traveling, still have weight. So that speed and that weight doesn't change. You know, the crash forces aren't going to change. Uh, just because you're in a bigger vehicle, you're still susceptible to injuries because your body can still fly around if you're not wearing a seatbelt. And it will, you know, nobody is strong enough to fight off 12,000 or even more pounds. So it all depends on your speed. Uh, but for occupants and SUVs, pickups, vans, these are all typically bigger vehicles, but seat belts can reduce the fatal injury to the driver and the front seat passenger by 60%. Huge difference. So those odds, you want those on your side at all times. So always wear your seat belt. And number six, it's not important for guys to wear seat belts. They are uh, the least at risk in a crash because they're bigger and stronger, right? We, but we've got maybe more mass, more muscle, all those things that make us guys, but more mass, more muscle is more weight. And then with speed, you know, 
your odds are going a whole lot uh, further down whenever you're not wearing a seatbelt because you're going to have a little bit more crash forces on your body. So because young men are most at risk, you know, they want to be daredevils, um, might be, uh, you know, want to challenge or um, not wear their seatbelts, you know, to kind of go against the law type thing and say, oh, I'm not going to wear it out. I think it should be my right or something like that. But uh, male passenger vehicle occupants, 18 to 34, who were killed in car crashes in 2017, you know, 60% of them were not buckled. Again, we see that 60% number. And think about all those deaths that didn't have to happen. And uh, that's a number that we need to work on to reduce. And we hope that you guys will do that. Thank you so much, Jesse. And if there's one thing to remember, it's the, the that equation you shared before us, weight times speed equals the impact. So teach others what you've learned today. Round three, polling questions. You have, we're gonna give you a minute to go through them. I think y'all can all answer them very quickly. Best guess. Maybe five, four, three, <clears throat> two, one. Troop, Trooper Lagrange, let's see what they said. All right. Pretty good on one, two, and hopefully everyone was able to get through those pretty quickly. Uh, number four was unanimous, number five is unanimous. All right, now we'll go over these real quick. Uh, true or false, every state has at least some kind of seatbelt law, and that is false. 49 states have seatbelt laws, and uh, the one state that doesn't is New Hampshire. Uh, they don't have anything as far as um, you know, adults and teenagers, things like that, but they do have a, a child passenger safety uh, law or requirements in their state, but outside of that, they don't. So uh, not too many people know that. So 49 states out of 50, uh, hopefully one day we can make it 50. All right, number two, how many <clears throat> unbuckled passenger vehicle occupants died in 2017? All right, 10,000 occupants, and that is out of around 35,000 a year. And that is approximate, I know, uh, some numbers, it's up close to around 36,000, uh, but these numbers are way too high and we can do our part by wearing our seatbelts to get those numbers down. Hopefully with this new year, we can change that trend. All right, number three, if you wear a seatbelt correctly while riding in the front seat of a car, your chances of a fatal injury are reduced by 45%. Now making, the most, uh, making it the most important thing uh, you can do in a day. So if you think about all the things that we do, but uh, riding in the car is one of the number one things. Sometimes it might be that school bus, uh, but it's something that we do every day. It's something we get accustomed to and we just need to make sure that, yeah, because I've been okay all throughout the years without wearing a seatbelt that you know, I'm okay tomorrow. You know, We need to change that habit if it is a bad one and make sure that we wear our seatbelt. All right, number four, is it, the, uh, is it best to use your seatbelt on long trips or short trips? And I think we all did 100% on this one that it is both because all trips can lead to serious or fatal injuries. And we don't think about them that way because like I said, we get away with it a lot and uh, we might not come across that person who is impaired or not paying attention and get involved in that crash in the first place. But you never know when those things are gonna happen. So make sure you click that belt and do it every trip uh, because you know we don't want to make it uh, your last trip. Now, number five, what is the best defense against drunk drivers on the road? 
again, that one was unanimous uh, seatbelt um, because there's no other way to really help what they're doing, but you can limit the injuries that you can incur whenever it comes to those, uh, um, those crash forces. Thank you so much, uh, Trooper Lagrange, and thank you all for your participation in this. Next, uh, Trooper Lagrange is also gonna tell us a little about, bit about the new child passenger safety law that was enacted in 2019. Yes, last year the law uh, did change and that was for a good reason um, because there was the laws in our state and then there was best practice. And a lot of times we had to go kind of, you know, against what our law said because there were better things that we could do outside of law to protect our children. Um, so from birth to at least two years old, they have to be uh, rear facing in an infant carrier or a convertible child safety seat. And that's just one that once they're big enough, um, they can spin that child seat around and convert it to forward facing. So that's why it calls, calls um, it that. Uh, but it's at least two. If they can benefit from staying rear facing longer, go ahead and do that. Um, because that seat does offer them uh, the most protection while they're rear facing because their heads are, you know, pretty heavy and their necks aren't developed and strong enough to support that weight whenever they're involved in that collision. So uh, that is the best part, uh, best practice whenever it comes to that. And then from there, we moved into the forward facing seats. And uh, if you can uh, see those pictures there, they do uh, range, if you look at the children, from a younger age group up to bigger. If you see the bottom right corner where uh, the, got the little young man in his Cub Scout uniform there, uh, but you can see their age difference. Now from two years old on up, um, at least to more than likely six years old, we want them in that forward uh, facing harness that gives them five points of contact basically. And it's gonna keep their their little bodies back uh, whenever they're involved in that crash. Because we have to remember crashes are violent and children are depending on us, whether they know it or not, uh, to make sure they're safe when riding in a vehicle. And then from four up to uh, eight years old, uh, once they, the children are getting into that, uh, that bigger age group, um, we know children vary in size, they vary in weight, uh, in height, and so the law is a little bit more broad whenever it comes to uh, their age, size, weight, things like that. Uh, because you might have an eight or a nine or a 10 year old who's bigger or smaller than other kids their age. So it does allow um, for that a little bit of wiggle room. Uh, but if you have somebody who is eight years old and is approaching that nine-year-old threshold where they can get out of that car seat or that booster seat. Um, then there's a five-step process um, that the state has developed uh, to make sure that child will be safe in that vehicle. And that five-step process is there at the bottom where number one, their backs have to be up against the back seat. Number two, their knees bend at the, uh, the natural bend or the edge of the seat, the lap belt, in number three, lines up across their lap and uh, properly it's not too high or too low. I definitely don't want it too high because then it'll be sit sitting in their uh, abdominal area, you know, closer to the stomach. And uh, we think about all the crash pressures that are put from that seat belt as we talked about earlier. So if it's too high, then um, they might need to be in that booster seat again to get them back up. But then number four, have to make sure that that shoulder belt goes across uh, the collarbone, basically. It's gonna cross all the strong bones of the body, the sternum, the rib cage, and down to the hips and uh, the pelvis to su support all that weight if they are involved in a crash. And then number five, they have to make sure that they sit there properly and safely the whole time. Make sure that they don't buckle it, that they don't put the shoulder strap behind them, but they wear it properly. And that way they'll be safe. Uh, Cause you, like I said, you never know when crashes are gonna happen. Thank you so much, Triple Lagrange. And thank you, University Medical Center for, for sharing all that information and the Louisiana Passenger Safety Task Force. And um, our next presenter is part of that as well as 
Trooper Lagrange. Uh, if you have any other questions, please make sure to visit the Buckle Up Louisiana Facebook page. This All this information can be found there for child passenger safety. Next up is Ms. Tracy Lemaire. She's married with two daughters, 24 and 16. She's moved here from New York in June of 1990. She has a bachelor's in behavioral science from New York Institute of Technology, as well as a bachelor's of science in criminal justice from UL Lafayette. She graduated school studies focused on injustices against women and minorities, longest standing board member of the Hearts and Hope Center for Sexual Trauma. She's the state coordinator for our sudden impact since 2014. And uh, she's also the Acadiana Area Regional Coordinator, Louisiana Passenger Safety Task Force. She's a certified technician and instructor. She's worked in social service since the 90s. She specialized in injury preven uh, prevention initiatives since 04. And she truly believes that if you love the work you do, you do not work a day in your life. All of these work experiences has led her to this point, she says, and take it away, Tracy. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so Thank much you. for having me. So the purpose of uh, me being here today is to talk about what we have. Tracy, hold on one moment, please. Let's look at that audio uh, just to make sure. Y'all didn't know that she was also a transformer. <laughs> yeah, that's what she sounded like. <laughs> she, is, she is that amazing. So we're going to look at that audio. Please bear with us just for a second. Um, and during that second, why don't y'all think of any Q and A's that you can go ahead and put in that chat box that we're gonna take care of after our next two presenters. You do not want to miss Tracy and you certainly don't wanna miss Mr. Dylan Ivy. He's gonna tell you how to put all of these great things that you were learning into action. So please just bear with us for one moment while we fix that audio for you. Oh, Tracy, we, we we have a comment that says my favorite New Yorker. You can, it, <laughs> we'll tell you the answer to that later. Can you hear me? Yes, so much yes, better. Thank better. you so much, Tracy. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So the purpose of me being here today is to share the information about our Saved by the Belt Award, which is what we do when we get information pertaining to people that were in car crashes and because they were wearing their seatbelt and not being at fault for the crash, they uh, get awarded for uh, and being recognized for having done that. So the program honors and recognizes individuals involved in crashes that were saved because they were wearing a seatbelt or properly restrained in a child safety seat. It is hoped that by promoting the benefits of the seatbelt usage, by using positive reinforcement in the way of awarding saved individuals for their conscientious use of occupant restraint, others will be encouraged to do the same. And with that, today we're going to briefly talk about Sydney and her award. Next slide, please. So Sydney Braun is a young student from Ascension Episcopal School of Acadiana. She is a volleyball team player. And she was involved in a crash on July 21st where a girl went through a stop sign and she T-boned her. So these pictures are of her car and those pictures are of the car of the other young lady who was driving. Both of them were seat belted, um, fortunately, and both those sustained some pretty serious injuries. Um, to Sydney's credit, it should be really recognized um, when the crash happened, it was late at night. She was coming home from somebody, a mutual friend's home. And um, she, when the crash happened, they were on the road by themselves in the dark for about 10 minutes before any first responders had come. And she did not hear the sound of the other driver for a little while to the point where she was feared that she had killed her. Um, but once she started making noise, she was screaming so loudly and, and in excruciating pain that just by circumstances, the first responder had come to Sydney's car first and Sydney asked that they please go to help the other young woman uh, because she was so afraid of, of the injuries just by hearing how um, excruciating the screams were. The other young woman, I believe, broke her jaw and maybe her pelvis. Um, you could change the slide. 
Sydney had some other um, injuries, which I'll talk about in a second. So the reason that seatbelts are so important is that first and foremost, it keeps you in the vehicle. And these were some things that Jesse had explained earlier. Um, it also protects the brain, neck, and spinal cord. It'll cross the hardest bones of your body, which are protecting the soft organs. It distributes the force of energy so that not every part, you know, so that the energy is separated around your body and not being put in one spot and deaccelerates the force, which helps you ride down the crash. And so by having all of those things in action is what helps you protect it in a crash. So this little slide shows you a video of how a crash works and sorry, how the seatbelts work in the crash. It is a European video, but you could see this, it's the same effect. This is a crash that's going 25 miles an hour. And as you can see, the back seat passenger is behind the driver, is or behind the, behind the passenger, the driver is not wearing a seatbelt and is causing him to come over to meet the driver, which can cause some serious injuries, if not a fatality. It says that it's known that Backseat passenger drivers in crashes are two times as likely to die in a crash if their backseat passengers are not seat belted. Next slide, please. So Sydney um, is here in recovery. These are just a couple of pictures that her mom had shared with me. You can go to the next slide. Sydney had broken both ankles and there was an injury or a gash to her knee, which is the upper left corner picture there that actually took over 200 stitches inside and out to repair. Next slide. Um, we talk about people in crashes and we talk about the statistics and how many serious injury crashes we hear about around the state or the country and how many fatalities, but Sydney is also somebody's daughter and sister and a teammate for her volleyball team. And so her face is not just a number. And it's important that people realize that numbers have faces attached to them. And it's all of those people are significant and important to save in the event of a crash and to educate to make sure that they know how to do that for themselves. Next slide. This is when she finally got to go back to school. Again. And if you look on the left hand side, the only girl wearing the little blue trim on her socks. This is one of the volleyball games or prior to a volleyball game. Um, that she, after she had her crash and repairs of her bodily injuries. So she's jumping up and down. And this is because she was wearing her seatbelt. She's able to still be part of the team and play volleyball. I don't know why the video is not playing. That is, it's right, Ron reminded me, it's the state quarter final match that she got to be in because she wore her seatbelt. I'm sure on July 21st or 2nd, she did not think she would ever be able to do that again. Next slide. So on November 18th, we went to the school that she attends Ascension and we had her peers come into the gymnasium and we got to publicly show them the significance of what wearing the seatbelt can do. And we awarded her with this presentation. Um, I spoke, Trooper Gossin spoke, um, and her mother, uh, Sydney actually spoke as well and shared her story. But this is what our award looks like when we present it to the student or to adults. We've done adults also receive Saved by the Belt Awards. Next slide. So this is us afterwards and Trooper Boisson is the one who was worked the crash after uh, onto the scene after it happened. So that's him with her on the bottom right and that's our team. Um, Nurse Dana Rogers from Lafayette General and Trooper Tommy Gossin and Trooper Scott Simmons are part of the sudden impact team here in Lafayette and that we were all together to honor her for her good decisions. Next slide. So as Cassie said, I am both the state coordinator for sudden impact and the regional coordinator for the Louisiana Passenger Safety Task Force in the Acadiana area. I um, love being involved in those initiatives and I, I feel that I do a great service to the community as we as a team have done wonderful things to help save the lives of young drivers and occupants of all ages 
uh, through the task force. And if uh, you happen to know of anybody that was in a crash that would be uh, suitable to receive a Saved by the Belt Award, please let us know. We do them all over the state and we would love to be able to continue to recognize people for making the correct choices by buckling up every seat, every ride, every time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tracy. And, and you're right, there is, there is a face or faces to each crash, each fatality. And I wanna thank Sydney for allowing us to share her story. She is a very strong young woman. And I hope that you all take this story and share with others because seatbelts do save lives. All right, we're gonna do our last round of polling questions. We're gonna go really quick. Um, I thank you all for, for spending this time with us and, and please bear with us through these polling questions because we have the best part also because you're gonna be able to take all this great information that Trooper Lagrange and Tracy and Shanita has shared with you and Dylan's gonna show you how to put that in action. So let's get through this last round of polling questions and we're gonna do a, a speed round. So five questions, get through them. All right, our last five. Hopefully y'all can fly through these and hopefully the answers are kind of obvious to you, um, but we'll find out here in a second. All right, so we're getting close to the end. Those last two, all right, here are our answers. All right, so through them again, the majority we've got on, looks like 10. And again, kind of evenly spread out towards the end, except for number five. All right, so let's go through those real quick. All right, most crashes happen within 25 miles from home. Yes, and uh, what we believe with that is, I mean, people get more complacent. Um, they're almost home, they're almost done with their ride, uh, uh, with their trip, and so they kind of let their guard down. And then that plays into a lot of short trips. Again, we think we're just going around the store, we might not have to wear our seatbelt, but that's when bad things happen because we're familiar with the area and we kind of you know, let our guard down. So hopefully 25 miles makes sense to you. Uh, child restraint use drops by 40% when, hopefully most of y'all picked, uh, when parents ride without their seatbelts. You know, children are creatures of habit and what they see us do, and of course this includes our cell phones, so let's, we'll throw that in there as well. But if we see them doing it, then they're probably going to emulate that. So they're going to do the same thing, same behavior. Teenagers, this goes again with uh, your peers. So if you've got friends that do it, or if you want your friends to have better habits, let them see you put it on, let you, them see you put that phone down, and hopefully um, they'll pick up that habit and do the same thing. All right, so number three, in 2017, seatbelts saved approximately how many lives? And that answer was 15,000. And again, that's around the same population as a major university. And that's every year. So imagine all those lives that were saved just by wearing that seatbelt, just making that one decision uh, to click it in and, uh, you know, making them uh, their selves uh, safer on the road. So we're so thankful for that, but we need that number to increase. All right, number four, in 2016, what percentage of passenger vehicle occupants aged 15 to 18 years old were not using restraints when killed in traffic crashes? That number was 58%, so it's over half, way too high. Think about all those lives that could have been saved. I mean, over half the lives that were involved in serious crashes could have been saved, or more than likely saved, by having that seatbelt on. Uh, again, we're not telling you that seatbelts are gonna save you every time because the faster people go, 
the bigger the mess is. So we always want to keep that in mind and let's not speed and wear our seat belts. And then number five, wearing your seat belt is your best insurance to prevent injury and death in a tragic case of a motor vehicle crash. True. We all know that uh, everyone got that one right. Uh, but it is the most important thing you can do because as I said, you might not be driving. You might be in the back seat. Can't control what happens, but you can control whether you put your seatbelt on or not. So make sure we do that. Buckle up every time, every trip, and um, and prevent those injuries from happening. Thank you so much, Trooper Lagrange. I really appreciate all of that great information. And please make sure to put your Q and A's in the box. We have a few to go over, and Ron will take that away later. But um, this is your last opportunity for a Q&A, but now I'm going to introduce our last and final speaker, and he's going to share with you all the great things that you can take all this information and do in your own community. Dylan Ivey serves as the Louisiana State Coordinator for SAD, the Students Against Destructive Decisions. His prevention route started in high school as a SAD, uh, as a SAD student, and not, not really, he was just a student against destructive decisions. And through the years, his passion for saving lives has turned into his career. For the last eight years, he has spent most of his time educating the young novice drivers and regarding occupant protection initiatives, as well as implementing SAD's Rock the Belt program in parishes across the Louisiana state. Take it away, Dylan. Thank you so much for having me here this evening. And uh, thank you so much to the coalitions for putting this together. It's an honor to be with you today to talk about this click that saves lives that so many of you know about your seatbelt and specifically about what we've done at SAD in regards to peer to peer strategies and things that you can do to encourage youth to um, promote that message to their peers. Okay, so we're gonna advance to the next slide. Okay, so about SAD. So for nearly 40 years, SAD has served for the nation as the nation's premier youth health and safety organization. And SAD stands for Students Against Destructive Decisions. And one thing about SAD is that we welcome youth participation, right? We really, we know that in order to influence the teens and young people, we want them at the table and we wanna really make a difference in their lives in doing that. And so that's where this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, process begins is a lot of the times in their schools and their communities and in those parishes that they work in. And a lot of this work that I'm gonna show you today, some of the different things that we've done over the years as it relates to occupant protection and seatbelt specifically, um, you know, comes from student ideas that they developed on their own. And so we have several different programs that we offer. Uh, we have, you know, a lot of programs that we do a lot of outreach for the GDL program, uh, Seatbelt Safety, which is our Rock the Belt program, which is what we do here in Louisiana. Also, we talk about drowsy driving, impaired driving, distracted driving in other parts of the country. But today's focus, of course, is seatbelts. So in Louisiana, we do a program called Rock the Belt, and it is actually sponsored by the Louisiana Highway Safety Commission. And we encourage students to buckle up in every ride, every seat, every time. It's a relay competition that we, we usually do when you know COVID is not among us. It's a little bit more tricky to do uh, in today's new climate that we're faced with, but definitely still things that we can do to raise awareness and encourage students to buckle up in every ride, every seat, every time. We do a quick click challenge where students compete and relay around a car and they buckle up in all four seats as quickly as they can to get record timing. And when we go to different schools to do this work, uh, the, the campaigns that we do look very different, right? Depending on the students, depending on the school, depending on what works best for them and their parish, depending on their communities, whether, whether we have community partners or not coming to the table. And so some of the things that you're gonna see, some pictures of different work that students have done that have really, they came up with these ideas to really uh, encourage their peers to wear their seatbelt and buckle up. Okay, so the first thing before we can even talk about peer-to-peer -peer programming, we really have to talk about what are some essential elements, right? And NHTSA has deemed peer-to-peer uh, -peer programming a very valuable resource in traffic safety education. And so these are some elements that NHTSA has uh, pretty much put out as guidance that, you know, what peer-to-peer -peer programming should include, right? 
So it should be teen led, meaning that students are the ones coming up with the programming pieces, the activities. It should be led by teens. They should be involved, right? They should be front and center and be involved in part of the work that you're doing. In order to change their behavior, they have to have that buy-in. They have to have some part in it and play some role in it as well. And it should be inclusive, right? It should include all people. It should include people of all background, like Shanita was talking about with diversity, right? It should include everyone. Everyone comes from different homes, different backgrounds, different communities. And it's very important that you bring everyone to the table. So when you're thinking of a school, you're gonna wanna include the cheerleaders, the band. You're gonna wanna include people that are on the football team, all students, not just a select group of students, all students. Uh, and then it's supposed to be sustainable, right? And that just means that, you know, some it's important that peer-to-peer -peer programming have some type of adult support, some type of support system that keeps uh, things organized. It kind of keeps things together and um, also sustainable in the sense from a funding perspective that your program is able to continue to run. It's very important that that adult support is there. And then some form of a, a facilitated training. When we do our quick click challenges, if we have an opportunity to meet with the students a little bit early, this can be as formal or informal as you want it to be, right? It doesn't have to be a formal sit down training depending on what the project or activity is that you're trying to do with the students. But it's very important that they understand the meaning behind the work that they're doing. And that can be done in a simple training, but the, there has to be some type of, uh, in order for it to be teen led and truly peer led, it has to, they have to receive some form of training, right? And then that, that whole why component is super, super important. Uh, your, your measurables, whatever you plan on, whatever your goal is, whatever you, your objective is that you plan on accomplishing, it's so important that that's clearly defined to the teens and the young people that you're going to be working with. And so one of the things uh, uh, that you'll quickly learn about teenagers is that they really don't want to get involved in something unless they understand why it's important. What we like to do is do a, a pre and post observational seatbelt survey before we do any type of either rock the belt quick click challenge or any type of you know prevention activity just so that they can see that you know because a lot of them are wearing their seat belts and they you know they may be doing the right thing but when they start to see that their peers are not it makes them realize what exactly are we doing what are we doing this for and why is this important right teens really want to understand why is this important and they have to have that buy-in to really be involved and also it's supposed to be positive the work that you're doing you know you're trying to put a positive spin on something that depending on how the message is delivered, it, it can be taken the wrong way. It could, you don't ever want to come off that you're judging someone for not doing what's right. So it's super important that you do it in a positive, uplifting way, uh, that you're not using scarce tactics or things like that, right? Things that are positive and you're doing something that really makes a difference that they can understand, that young people can understand why this is important. And it's, it's the right thing to do. If you're trying to change negative behavior, you shouldn't use negative, uh, you know, methods or elements, right? And then incentives and recognition. So incentives could be things that you're encouraging that positive be behavior to continue to happen. And some of the examples that I'm going to show you today was where we were, we, we actually in the past have given out incentives for doing positive things in the community, whether you're, you know, whether you're wearing your seatbelt, maybe you give someone a coupon for wearing your seatbelt or whatever, whatever um, incentivize someone to to do that behavior more frequently, more often. And then recognizing the teens is super important as well. You know, everyone, everyone wants to feel like they're a part of the team. They wanna feel like they're welcome. They wanna feel like they uh, bring something to the table and that's how you want them to keep coming back. You know, you want teens to continue to come back. So it's super important that you recognize them for their hard work and their efforts. And that can be something as simple as a thank you note I write many and many of those, uh, uh, but you know, it could be anything, you know, any type of recognition that you can give them a, a quick text message. Thank you for your help today, you know, and that sounds like something very simple, but you'd be surprised um, when you incorporate this in your work and you include recognition in your work, it really does make a big difference in the sustainability of your program. And then the last part, which is very important is evaluation, right? Making sure that your program is, uh, successful and making sure that your program is, you know, clearly defined that those, you know, desired outcomes are obtained. And so that evaluation component is extremely important as well. Next slide.
Okay, so the first thing that I wanted to tell everyone about was our Quick Click Challenge, which is a high energy team competition that demonstrates how easy it is for a teen or anyone to put on their seatbelt. And so what we do is we break teams into groups of four. We have them relay around the car as quick as they can, buckle their seatbelt. And what it teaches them is that if they can buckle their seatbelt in four seats, stumble around all four of their friends, you know, running around, get out, run around the car, and they can do this in like 30 seconds, four times. How easy is it for them to put on their seatbelt the minute they get in the car, right? Three seconds or less. It's super easy, super high energy, very competitive. I love a great competition and the teens love it too. This is something that we actually uh, go into the schools and implement and we'd love to implement it in your communities. I know we've got several different people represented on the call. Um, and depending on where you're located, we could possibly make that happen, but it's not something that we have to do alone, right? We're willing to share this with everyone, and if it's something that you can do or implement and you want to implement in your community, we're happy to have those conversations with you. We want to, you know this work to continue, and we want people to do this. It's definitely something uh, that we love doing, and we would love to come and be a part of it, uh, but it's very important that students are involved, and they're involved in this by participating, but also leading this and facilitating the effort. So they, they can be a part of it by you know, ensuring that their peers are buckling up when they're actually participating, right? Blowing the whistle out between uh, individual rounds of the game as they run around the car. Uh, we also usually have flag people that are helping us and, and also taking pictures and doing things like that to really make it fun and upbeat and just make it as, as really a great of a good time as we can. It's positive, it's uplifting, and it encourages them to wear their seatbelt. Next slide. Okay, so this is something that we've really done for many years, and some of you may be familiar actually with Chalk the Walk, and it's something that we kind of, because of COVID, you know, SAD really had to pivot. I mean, our whole organization was dependent on students, you know, students against destructive decisions, and so we really had to try to come up with ways that students could do some of the, the work that we do in the schools at home, and so actually during co the quarantine, um, this was just two of the images uh, that our students actually uh, did with chalk messages in their concrete, you know, on, you know, in their driveways at home. Um, but it's chalk the walk, right? You give a kid a, a piece of chalk and you're amazed to see what they can do uh, and the messages that they can really create uh, in their community. This was great when we did this around um, uh, Halloween. We had some students participate in this and they drew chalk messages all up and along their driveways and all along their uh, sidewalk. So when people were walking around to trick or treat, this is what they were seeing in their subdivisions and in the areas that they were in. So uh, this is just some of the best artwork, in my opinion, that we have had um, since a lot of this quarantine, you know, COVID has uh, happened. Um, this has really been a successful activity that we've continued to do. But this was also something that we would do in the schools, right? And it's funny, it's it's crazy to me, uh, high school, these were both high school students that did these two, uh, but I mean, high school students love chalk just as much as elementary kids. You'd be so surprised what a high school student will do with some chalk. <clears throat> Okay, this is something that we've done uh, several times depending on the holiday, and we call it Sweet Safety Treats, and this particular one we did during Valentine's Day, and this was, this was uh, Sweet Tarts, and they had a message on them that said, you're too sweet to be ejected from your seat. The students came up with the message, they came up with uh, the candy that they wanted to put on the message, you know, the, that they wanted to use the candy for the specific message, and uh, they dispersed them into their uh, school. It was really cool. They did it all through the Commons area, and it was very, very interesting to see uh, how quick the message got around the campus with just passing out candy. This was something that we did on Valentine's Day, and this was actually a high school-led effort where a high school walked across the street to actually do this with the middle school students. And so it was really cool to see those groups of students come together and really make a difference in their community. <clears throat> this was that, you know, in what we were talking about earlier with incentivizing good positive behaviors behind the wheel. We partnered with a local Mexican restaurant to disseminate free queso coupons to people who 
were wearing their seatbelt. And so we got a group of high school students together. And actually, they went into this at Walmart. This particular group of students did this at a local Walmart near their hometown. And so they went and partnered with a Mexican restaurant. And, and the Mexican restaurant was super supportive and made the coupons and gave them to us. And it was great for them because it brought people into their business to participate and be a part of uh, their restaurant so they increased their sales right so it was great for them it didn't cost us anything because you know we didn't have to you know try to find funding to get this done I mean the restaurant donated in a sense to the people that you know were buckling up and participating and so that was really great to see and so that's kind of one of the things that we talked about was incentivizing good positive behaviors behind the wheel and the conversations that that started from this were pretty impressive too, to see the students interact. And what it does for the students is really monumental. I mean, it really is phenomenal to see students come out of their comfort zone and get them working uh, on a topic area that they really like to talk about and they really wanna talk about because they know they're saving lives by doing this. And uh, the people that are getting the queso coupons were just super excited because they got a free queso from this Mexican restaurant. So that's part of that incentivizing good work. Okay, and this is what we call a fast fashion show, right? Kind of a play on a fashion show. But basically, we've had students uh, throughout the years, and this one, this is two different scenarios here, where they basically take duct tape. You give a student a roll of duct tape, and you make, you encourage them to actually design a seat belt with a life-saving message on it that they wear around campus that day. And they, you know, you work it out with the administration that, hey, this is something that they're going to do. Is, is this okay that they do? And would they be allowed to have basically a free dress day and wear this at school this day? And they do. And it's like a fashion show around the school. Or you could do something a lot more formal, depending on if your school does a, like a specific uh, prom fashion show or if they do something similar, you know, at school that's relatively maybe around prom, depending on when it was. Um, but just something that encourages them uh, yet again to buckle up and wear their seatbelt. And it's a conversation starter. When they're walking down the hall, they're like, what is on your shirt? You know, and it's a seatbelt, right? So, and the next one is I buckle up because. And so we've kind of changed this during the pandemic since, you know, all the, everything has started with everything being virtual. Um, you know, usually if we're in person, we might would have students actually take duct tape and do this. Uh, and write, you know, something that really hits close to them. So like they wear their seatbelt because they love their parents or they wear their seatbelt because they love to dance or like trying to make them find, uh, you figure out a way that, you know, why do you wear your seatbelt? You know, you do it, yes, because it's a law and you do it because, you know, it keeps you safe. But but what what's the true, like, what is something that's really near and dear to your heart that really makes you want to wear your seatbelt? You, you wear your seatbelt to live and what are you living for, right? And so really kind of getting them to figure out ways to kind of think outside the box on that. And then we promote that on social media and they promote it on their social media. And so the one on the left, you'll see there's a student where she just took her se a selfie, like a seatbelt selfie of herself wearing her seatbelt, which we do a lot of those as well. And then she just put a, a little text box around her seatbelt of why she buckles up. You know, I buckle up, I wear my seatbelt for my family or I wear my seatbelt so that I can see my dog when I get home or, or whatever, you know, whatever's closest to them. And so those are just some of the things that we have done, just kind of a little spotlight really quickly of what we've done at SAD to really encourage youth to continue to educate their peers on the importance of wearing their seatbelt. If I can ever be of assistance to you, your team, your coalition, please reach out. We'd love to partner. You know, we have schools that we need to get into and reach. And if that's something that we can work together to make that happen and bring our message to your communities, we would love to do that. So thank you all for your time today. And I hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you so much, Dylan. That is such great information. And thank you for sharing how to put all of this information into action. Um, I cannot thank you, Shanita, Jesse, and Tracy enough. And Ron, our coordinator in Acadiana, is going to handle the Q&A. And I want to thank you all participants for being on and having questions and bearing with us through our technical difficulties. Ron, take it away. Yeah, first off, can everybody hear me? 
Yes. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. We had some difficulties earlier, and I'm, I'm glad we ironed those out. First, I'm going to fix my hair real quick, <laughs> present myself for, for uh, television. We had three questions uh, that came up through Q&A. The first was, uh, why is it legal to ride in the back of uh, a truck, but not in the back of an SUV uh, cargo area? Uh, the risk in the back of the truck seems greater. I would initially typed a response to that, and I, I basically my, my response was that I agree with the observation uh, because it, it seems to be uh, accurate, but uh, the law in Louisiana it says that if you are a passenger in a motor vehicle, inside a motor vehicle, one person per factory installed seat belt is what is, that's, that's the law. Um, it, it, I agree, it would seem to be uh, safer in the cargo area of an SUV as opposed to the back of a pickup truck, but that's what the law says. Uh, the next question that came up is, why can't our radio stations have a segment in the morning uh, that can address traffic safety locally. Um, uh, as far as radio stations go, KPEL uh, is uh, a fantastic safety partner of ours. Uh, and uh, the, we use uh, frequently are asked to speak uh, to KADN here locally. Uh, and as far as people in the uh, other areas, uh, I, would, I would check your, your local radio stations and local television stations. Uh, they do run these spots. Sometimes catching them uh, and, and finding them uh, can be difficult. They are uh, generally very early in the morning, uh, which uh, Ashley can attest to that, having had to be there very early on many occasions. Uh, but they do run those. It's sometimes just a little difficult to find. Uh, and the, the final question we had um, was, does the height, weight, uh, height and weight still apply uh, for booster seats? Yes, it does. Um, first, I'm going to say that uh, on, uh, for most, the, the most accurate information on this, that you should probably uh, refer to Louisiana Revised Statute 32-295. Louisiana has been uh, noted as having one of the premier child safety seat laws uh, in, in the country. Um, and it's, uh, it, it, you should be able to find your answers there. However, uh, one of our speakers from earlier, uh, Tracy LaMare or Michael Toops, and I know he was on here, I saw his name earlier, uh, are also good people uh, as a resource to, to find for answers to uh, other questions regarding this. You can also check uh, Buckle Up Louisiana and Louisiana Sudden Impact, both good resources. Can I add something to that, Ron? Absolutely. Uh, yes, whenever it does come to um, the individual child seat, make sure you check the side of the child seat where all the stickers are and read those stickers and it'll give you the height and weight limits uh, for that particular seat because it does vary from car seat to car seat. So keep that in mind, whatever you do have, check the side of it and uh, compare that to your child and get the information from that also. Okay. Th uh, thank you, yeah. thank you, Jesse. Um, right now, uh, as I'm looking, there are no further questions. So in an effort to uh, wrap things up, uh, I wanna give a huge shout out and thank you to uh, Trooper Lagrange, Shanita Vasquez, Tracy LaMare, and Dylan Ivey, uh, clearly an exceptional lineup of uh, presenters today uh, with such great and valuable information for us. Um, huge shout out to Ashley Moran. I know she's not expecting it, but Ashley uh, really put in a ton of work to put all of this together and put, put everything in its neat place uh, to pull this off. Um, but on behalf of Cassie Parker and myself, uh, I want to thank everybody for attending. Uh, I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And please, everybody, uh, be safe on our Louisiana roadways. And buckle up. Yes, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful New Year's and happy holidays. Bye. Happy holidays.